So I've never been able to figure out if, you know, the buzzwords of we pivoted, we evolved. To say we didn't pivot, we didn't evolve, whether good or bad signals, right? Mm. I, I will, that's only time to tell. I don't even kind of particularly believe anybody external can judge on this. But a couple of facts of Buildesk. When we started in 2000, beyond the philosophies we discussed, we also did one more thing. We said Buildesk would have uh, no defined hierarchy for people in the traditional organization sense and no designations. 23 years later, we still stick to that. Uh, we have no designations. I mean, uh, other than what is a regulator required to say a company secretary, see, so I mean, those kind of uh, ask the So part. what are people called? People are just called a member of a certain team. Uh, 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 appointment letter would say you're a member of a technology team, member of a business team, right? You could be a member of a team with a, let's say one crore salary, you could be the member of a team with a five Like Your appointment letter will not read different, your designation will not read different. The voice you just heard belongs to MN Srinivasu, the co-founder of Buildesk, a leader in India's massive and chaotic payment solutions sector. Notice I did not say co-founder and CEO. That's because Srinivasu and two of his co-founders, Ajay Kaushal and Karthik Ganapati, are all co-founders. They don't have separate designations. Not only that, the three co-founders continue to work from a single desk in the same room. 23 years after they started the company that is today Buildesk. A company that processes somewhere between 12 to 14 lakh crore rupees worth of payments in a year. In dollar terms, that would be between 150 to 175 billion dollars annually. For a 23-year-old organization that handles over $150 billion in payments, Buildesk is surprisingly lean at just over 800 employees. That's not the only thing that's contrarian about it. It has been profitable for over a decade and a half now. Buildesk also has no formal hierarchies or designations. People are hired as members of a team. That's it. When I asked Vasu, that's how Srinivasu is usually addressed by others. How old he was, his answer was, Buildesk is 23, I am 55. Welcome to the 25th episode of First Principles. For this episode, I throw in many new questions based on the subscriber feedback I'd been receiving. For instance, some of them are, what often keeps founders going is the urge to prove something. What is it for Vasu? How has his view of a leadership team evolved? How does he prefer to be managed upward by his reporters? How has what excites or challenges him changed? Managing people isn't what founders have in mind when they start out, and yet it is often the most important thing that determines their success. How has Vasu's managing style or philosophy evolved since he started Buildesk in 2000? Over the entire conversation, we also talk about why Buildesk doesn't handle person-to-person -person payments. For instance, why UPI? How the three co-founders hired and coached their first 100 employees. Why Buildesk does not incentivize chasing glory metrics. And why the three co-founders continue to work from a single table even today. Stay on and keep listening for another wonderful conversation around leadership, long-term thinking and perspective. Before I leave you with the conversation, I have a request. If you like First Principles, please rate us on your favorite app or platform. Your ratings are one of the strongest signals for us. Vasu, it's great to finally be able to catch you after all these months of us exchanging messages and emails and texts. Thank you for being on the show. Oh, I hope this will be interesting. <laughs> I'm sure it will be. I just want to start with the company's name, Buildesk. 
how did it come about because it came up you're a 23 year old organization now and the name itself build desk i think reflects what you set out to build but not necessarily perhaps what you are today so do you want to tell me what build desk is and what was the reality that led you to create it uh there is a long story in the short story i'll go with the shorter version first uh the name of the company is india ideas so when we started essentially as a name refer that was the theme that we will keep building on ideas and we said india ideas and we said the shorter version is the first thing we said is will help people pay bills we need a name that clearly reflects the purpose of the the platform we're building and build us became the uh, a very this is 2000, 2000 when you started 2000 march paying bills do you want to tell us like you know why was that a problem or an opportunity that the three of you saw so what we set out to do wasn't about people paying bills what we set out the, the three co-founders was we said we see an opportunity which is essentially india transforming uh, world trends of technology internet those these are the broad vectors of change that were happening india had i think less than 50000 internet users at that point in time so it wasn't a this is during the dot com uh, post uh, we were working in athra anderson at that point in time and we kind of quit our jobs in the middle of 99 by the time we got relieved of the roles it was the end of 31st december 99 world was perhaps going through a dot com india didn't have any, india still hadn't seen the big exit which happened later uh but this was, we didn't think of it as a dot com. So if you look at it, uh, there was nothing we did which was, which focused on dot coms, eyeballs, which were the, the driver's metric those days. We looked at purely as, uh, if, if however much of a misnomer it is, internet as a technology, as to what does it do. What we were more familiar with was uh, what was happening in India, within that in particular financial services and banks. So we saw an opportunity saying, look, India is going through a change. Uh, contextually, you had the private banks had come up. So, and there was pressure on the, the non-private banks, or the public sector banks, to kind of transform. And they were in the throes of transformation. You had Infosys as a big provider of platforms for banking solutions. Uh, and in our earlier avatar, as part of the consulting role, we'd, we'd been working with banks, and we had some understanding how they were all thinking, which was essentially that they would go from being physical branch-based accounts to full technology platforms, and technology was being seen as a tool, as a way to reduce costs, as a way perhaps to reduce the, the branch-led presence. Somewhere that was the thought. Where we came from was a more of an India context to say, whatever you do in India, technologies in the first phase can never be a cost reducer. It will only increase costs. Second, you can never eliminate jobs using technology. It doesn't work for India. So we said inevitably there'll be a point in time when people investing in technology, the banks, would look at how do I get ROI from what I'm doing. And that is the thesis which we set out. So when we started in Jan 2000, this is the only premise we had. Banks will invest in technology, uh, and therefore banking, and therefore financial services will go through a change. Uh, focus today is to use technology as a tool to reduce costs. How do we work on something that helps people generate ROI out of this? That was the first thesis. The second thing became, how do you do it? Do you do it independently as a, a dot-com company of, with your own brand, which you quickly eliminated a uh, function of, let's say, our backgrounds, our DNA, to capital, to environment, lots of things. But we said we were best positioned to make things work through uh, platforms or channels that are already trusted, which was in those days banks in the first place. So we said, what can we do with banks for them to deliver to customers something on a technology platform, which is useful to customers, non-threatening to banks in terms of uh, external provider doing this, at the same time, revenue accruing. Th that was the key part. I can see from everything that you're saying that this has consultant thinking written all over it because you're trying to triangulate it from various places that who has the money, what, what is the use case, like etc. As opposed to many first-time founders who are essentially looking for an itch to scratch. So, uh, Partly agree, partly disagree. This is where it has a consultative approach in an intuitive sense, in the way I articulated mm -hmm. for understanding of somebody outside, right? For the three of us, this is an intuitive first step. It is not that you're working through a framework to come to this. Where did the framework come in, so to speak? This was the intuition part of what we want to do. The framework came in to say, 
how do you present something to someone to the bank to help them understand and that's where again going back to build as we said where can you help or work with this it was about either uh, in those days again if look at the market people were starting to invest into online through into stock markets you had icici direct in some form you had travel coming up so we said can we work with banks to to enable online trading or let's say online loans or online selling of commerce and in that that's when we applied the framework said these may not work because there's an evolution process and banks are not the logical places for customers to do bills became the logical place from just an indian environment so the framework came in that point saying intuitively leverage technology leverage internet rather and get customers to pay leverage the fact that banks are investing into core technologies and the product fit was more of that framework to say if you start with bills it's something which is non which is important for us to say it's something that does, that doesn't threaten a bank uh, that enables an open partnering opportunity rather than a vendor positioning and that's how it started do you remember what was the first bill that was ever processed on your platform uh, through bank of baroda the uh, what is today adani electricity but there was a bscs earlier and went through phase of bscs to reliance to was adani. it one of you founders who made the first uh, payment or was it actually a customer transaction which was well it is actually a customer it, this again for uh, this was uh, you must realize that for in, we launched it in 2001 we started hmm. the company in 2000 the first uh, service went live in 2001 it was a big deal for a public sector bank to do something on the internet so this is a fairly large public launch uh we had a bank of baroda customer i mean obviously on stage uh, it was done but it was a customer bill payment and today 23 years later what is bill desk uh the core to bill desk is still that it's about enabling people to make payments through channels that they trust uh through payment modes that they prefer or that they own and to whichever entities they want to make a payment to if that was the thesis in 2000 that's pretty much still the thesis what has widened this so to speak the canvas and and let's say our identification of the trust points we initially began with banks as being the sole custodians of the trust to then saying no even a large merchant an lic can be a point of trust customer will go to an lic channel and say i will make this payment and i trust lic that if i'm making the payment it will go through from there it translated to the larger merchant entity saying if customer went to a private entity and made a payment they likely trust so that canvas has changed the range of payments has changed nothing to do with us but how india has evolved and market has evolved De- the customer base and the depth has changed uh, but if you look at it we are sitting on a pretty beautiful things right i mean it it will always be relevant even 20 years from now that if you're saying i'm the, sitting in between two people one who need to receive payments and one who need to make the payments as a role that will always remain relevant right it's it's just question of how important that role is or how embedded the rules that will keep changing can you give us a sense of your scale today using whatever metrics um, that you disclose yeah a lot of information in the public domain we are a regulated entity therefore there is a lot more than normal but the metric that we kind of target is to say that uh, what is the total flow of money that's happening through us because structurally i mean just to give you a context to it you can do five payments of 500 100 rupees each and one person could be doing one payment of 500 end of the day the share of wallet is the same it's irrespective of how it's broken up uh, so we go by the flow of money um, yeah that's between 12 to 14 lakh crores on the platform uh, currently annually yeah annually and i don't know do you track market share because the last number that i had from one of our own stories done by my colleague arundhati was over a 50% market share in bill payments we don't track that in the sense we have honestly found it hard to define the denominator to the market i mean there are various ways you can cut and dice it uh, we don't believe we have that kind of a share uh, that uh, somebody externally would assess but that i think is more a problem of defining what the market is and uh, relevant market i mean what happens with these kind of things is different constituents put out different ways of defining market depending on what suits that particular need as i said the uh, again bill kind of narrowly defined uh, na- narrows down the scope of what we play you could perhaps make a what a tax payment in hyderabad today using that so denominator can change depending on how you define it 
the only way we define is what's the if you look at total flow that's happening in economy what part uh, so at some point the best way to measure is percentage of gdp at some point uh, what goes through you what we don't do is person to person which is a higher velocity right we do end use case payments that you need to make a payment for either purchasing something or paying for a service so it's person to business or person to institution any uh, other than anything other than p2p right the p2p is is not measurable in sense it's obviously a good use case i need to give me as why why we don't do the function of two two three things uh when we started right uh, the uh, one was that was going to be a far more difficult objective to achieve given that people weren't trusting institutions to pay to p2p would have been far more tougher second uh, was the factor that dispute resolution in p2p is finally a function of how people are self disciplined you can't keep going to courts or tribunals that wasn't the strongest suit for this country in those days and you also don't have a very robust framework from a grievance redressal or a let's say legal perspective i would argue that still does not exist in which is p2p p2p uh, p2 it wouldn't yeah. and people honor any framework only when they feel uh, think resolution will be quicker right if you think you can get away with it for 20 years you're likely to still flout the law india doesn't have that yet the third aspect was different thing that we in those days and even now we still believe rbi for example or a central agency has an extremely powerful p2p platform which is offered free to customers and therefore there is never going to be great commercial use case from it neft and at a larger level rtgs have been available to indian customers for over 20 years i would say free of cost more, nearly free of cost and that's p2p i mean uh, we didn't see ourselves doing a better job at a platform level from and therefore it made sense to focus elsewhere how does build us make money how does it earn money you talked about the flow uh, that goes through you before you listen to mn shrinivasu's answer to rohan's question i have something to tell you very quickly i am snegda from the kent's newsroom and i host a podcast called daybreak The 2023 Asia Cup cricket tournament began yesterday. And if you go just by news reports, Disney Star is going to earn anything between 350 to 400 crore rupees in ad revenues from it. Now, considering what happened with IPL, it does sound like Disney is doing pretty well, right? I mean, it seems to be making up for losing the IPL digital streaming rights to Reliance's Jio Cinema. And irrespective of all this, if you go just by the number of paid subscribers, Disney Hotstar is the leader of the Indian OTT space even now. But OTT is a complex business, especially in India, and just having the largest subscriber base is not really enough. And the story of Disney's decline in India is testament to it. The way the OTT giant is headed, it almost seems like it is making space for Jio to take its crown away. To find out all about it, tune into the latest episode of my podcast Daybreak. You'll find the link in the show notes of this episode. Thank you for listening to us and if you like our audio offerings, please subscribe, rate and follow on whatever podcast platform you're tuned into. And now, back to First Principles with Rohan. So what we believe our platform does is render a service primarily to the person who's receiving money right you need to receive money from a million customers so million customers also need to make a payment to you but the, the value we are rendering to the person who's receiving is in that sense higher so we charge a fee of the person to whom we are delivering this service that's the uh, how big is uh, build us today in terms of let's say employees uh build desk itself is about 800 employees give or take a couple of year 800 oh, wow that's for the quantum of payments that you handle that's not a very large organization uh, especially in these days when we are talking about um startups that have thousands and thousands of employees is this by design uh, very much by design but while even even as i come back to it i don't i mean there are different philosophies of how you build company right in today's times or in the let's say last 7 8 years it's been an easier approach to build companies by throwing money and people fundamentally if you're building a business you look at what resources are available what and how expensive how cheap they are 
in the last few years, time has been the most precious commodity. Money and people have been easier to come by. Uh, and success and failure have had different connotations. So it's okay to, uh, to kind of build something, hire a thousand people, doesn't work, fire them or let them go and move on. Uh, for us, it didn't work then, it's unlikely to work now because it has essentially two philosophies. One in terms of, are we that kind of a people or a business who kind of believe in saying, let's take a shot at something and see whether it works or not. I think we more come from a depth of, we have an understanding of what would be needed. Uh, it might take time to win that game, but we are more, I think, long term, just as a DNA, we are more long term, more institution building, more uh, lasting, building something lasting is a natural way of doing things. Uh, and that by definition means you have, you can think through stuff. Uh, that's one part of the business. From a people perspective, uh, the focus has always been, we were building a business in a domain that didn't have uh, experts or any prior kind of, there were no other company, we were among the first to start. So you kind of have to train people to get there. Uh, so to that extent, it's easier to say, we'll get good people, train them, empower them, give them enough freedom, whatever all the, uh, give them enough work in the way they are interested in. Uh, which then kind of eliminates the need to have five people doing something. One person is, people in, inherently are capable of doing a lot more if they're invested into what they're doing and if they understand what they're doing. If they're operating in the periphery, then it's like a siloed bit. But uh, we've always had a different philosophy there. You've been profitable for over a decade now, right? 15 years, I would think, 15, 16, yeah. During that time, you've also raised a significant amount of risk capital, venture capital, private equity, etc. Do you have a sense of how much um, capital you've raised during that time? And my next question would be very naive, but if you are profitable, why do you need to raise so much venture capital? Uh, so we haven't raised a lot of capital. Uh, the total capital we raised uh, and build this company for it till the time it became profitable was essentially this. And let me express in rupees because dollar terms keep changing. We raised uh, a total of two and a half crores of equity in 2000. I mean, over a period of three, four years, but in that from the same set of investors, we raised about two crores of equity and two crores of debt. Uh, the debt was repaid uh, within the first five years. It was more of a debenture structure, but we raised two crores of equity in between 2000 and 2005. In 2005, uh, we raised what was then $7 million, but in today's terms, there were $3 million, right? About 30 odd crores is what we raised. That is the only primary capital that was raised ever for us to become profitable. Uh, so the risk capital or the comfort capital we raised was this, the 30 crore. The company was built on that four crores. Uh, 30 crores was the capital to lie in an account to give comfort to employees saying you will get a salary and for us to have the comfort saying we can promise that. And and if thinking those just the moment we need to dip into it, that 30 crores is when we kind of have to start getting cautious about are we doing the right thing about the business. So it was built on that. So this is the total capital raised in the first decade. In the last seven, eight years, as uh, some of the early investors exited, right? And newer investors came in, uh, they needed to have a certain ticket size to invest. So we, so even as we were doing the, the secondary transaction, we did a small bit of primary more to uh, facilitate that transaction to go through and also to fund some of the acquisitions we're doing. But it was never meant for the core business. So, so not a lot of capital. How old are you? Buildesk is 23 years old. Uh, I am 55 today. Um, are you married? Do you have kids? Single. You're three co-founders, right? Yeah. Who are your other co-founders? Two of them. Uh, Ajay Kaushal and Karthik Ganpati. <laughs> Just to give you their backgrounds and where we, we all met up in Arthur Anderson. Uh, but as a deeper background, Ajay is from IIT, Madras, IIM, Lucknow, SBA Capital Markets, Arthur Anderson. Uh, Karthik is from IIT Bombay, I am Bangalore, Arthur Anderson. Uh, 
and and we met up in Anderson. So the one factor was when Ajay was in SBI Capital Markets, and my first job was ITC. I did my BCom from Madras University, then I am Ahmedabad, then I joined ITC. So both Ajay and I have had the pleasure of working with Karthik when we were on the client side, and Karthik came in from the uh, Anderson as a consultant. So that's we knew him in that sense. But uh, really speaking, I joined Anderson in 1999 April. Ajay joined a little before that from SBI Capital Market. We met up there. So to complete the picture, Ajay and Karthik are married, two kids each, all in Bombay. And and the three of you are still co-founders. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, right from day one till today, all three of us have sat at one table, one room. Uh, that's been the way it's been always. Even today. Even today. If you were starting up today, the three of you were starting up today, would you do anything differently about how you started up? I know it's a if, odd question because so much has changed as well, but still. Uh, I think philosophically we wouldn't do too much, too many things different, which is to say if I were to just take us as being the age we were when we started and in starting off in today's environment of a slightly more mature market in terms of the, those core vectors. Uh, within the opportunity set, we saw I think we'd still go the same way of what is it that enables us to build something for the longer term, something that's more institutional, uh, something that will stay deeply embedded, not something that necessarily needs to have visible announceable wins every three or six months. That wouldn't be the way we would do it. Uh, we wouldn't do, I don't think we would do anything very different in the way we're building an organization or the people. Uh, adjusted, of course, to the times. Uh, we, would, we would be careful about the kind of quantum of money we would raise and how we would deploy it. I think our orientation to core things wouldn't change. That would be much tougher today, right? Because back then, um, I'm assuming a reason for you to be frugal was also lack of availability of significant capital. And today we don't live in such times. It's it is, but relevant to times. For example, when we raised our first money, which was uh, two crores of equity, right? Uh, we selected the institution we wanted uh, the equity from, that which was Sidby Venture and Bob. For Bob, this was the first ever equity investment they did. And Sidby Venture had a venture fund, but it was in its first year of venture investing into startups, right? We were clear about the profile of investor we wanted. And well, I'm, it might be a good way to think of it saying, if we raise two crores, but the total offer we had not from these, but from other people who wanted to invest was 10 crores that time. So clearly in, in the metric sense, ability to attract capital, let us say, if that we raised X, we had the ability to get 5X. We chose not to do the 5X route. I would assume today that number two might become 200 crores, but... Uh, you said you chose uh, Sidby and Bank of Baroda. Why? Why did you choose them? What did you see in them? Out of, you know, why were they the 20% out of the 100%? Uh, I think two two reasons. Um, venture capitalists weren't, wasn't a very uh, mature in industry or set of players, right? And uh, we wanted capital from people who by definition would be long term, which was not the nature of venture capital then or even now. Second was we knew we were getting into payments, which was broadly a regu not regulated as payments, but within the regulated industry of banking. And we wanted that the kind of partners we get as equity also reflected the seriousness which we were building the business and somewhere benefit from the trust that get implicitly ascribed to us because those people trusted us. Those are the key reasons. When you look back at build us 23 years of evolution. Do you see significant stages, narrative stages in it's like, you know, I mean, often like, you know, I mean, are there three stages, four stages? Do you look back and see the story in your mind in chapters? Um, in a sense, yes, but not so much from internal happenings, but let's say external, right? The one way to think of it uh, is 2000, 2009 when there was uh, a certain kind of market uh, where India still wasn't vibrant from an internet perspective. 
payments was not a business. Payments was something that somebody was flirting with from banks and merchants' perspective. And from a regulatory perspective, this was not even on the radar, so to speak, right? That I think of it as phase one. Uh, 2009 is when RBI first came up with some degree of regulation um, and an act, the Payment Settlement System Act kind of uh, came into play. So I look at that as the start of the second phase, um, which is yeah, to th broadly 2010 till maybe year 2016, 17. And 2016, definitely the start of a third phase, which is the uh, coincides with the India focus on digital agenda linked to the post demon period, right? So I would think of it as in three phases. Of course, the third phase has been, you can cut it down to multiple ways. There, there has been the pandemic, there has been UPI, so many other things happening in this third phase. But broadly, if I were to think of it, I would think of it in those three. What phase are we in today? So, Let's say the last one year or so. I think for India, pandemic had a See, a couple of things came together, whether by design or accident, right? Uh, you had demonetization happen. You had GST happen, which effectively was an attempt also to shift the informal sector into a formal sector. And it had its own impact on small and medium businesses. Uh, you had UPI starting in and around the same time. And then you had pandemic, which kind of gave wings to UPI, right? Uh, Simultaneously, at this, around this point, it also coincided with a couple of things, which is uh, competition of marketplace-wise, couple of consumer internet companies believing th th they should play in this terrain. And in, in that sense, we're looking at players like, let us say, a phone pay, a GPay, or a Paytm, essentially focused on consumer inter internet and consumer technologies. But um, platforms, India gave them the platforms of UPI and other things, which made it easier to get into payments, right? Otherwise, that is fairly difficult business to get in. So all this came together to get to one end place we have, which is today that you digital payments are extremely easy in this country, right? Uh, and it's reached, and of course, not to forget what Geo did in terms of transforming internet access. So all this have come together to today make payments a a commodity, widely usable, easily usable and reaching deeper than what anybody could have thought of in a structured manner. So that's where we are today. Uh, layered on top of this, is, or rather ring fencing all this, is the regulatory mandate around it saying the most popular methods of payment need to be mandatorily offered free. UPI and rupee, they, they debit up free. So that's the construct of the environment we are today in. Coming back to you and your co-founders, you work out of the same table. But I'm sure you have different areas that you look after. How did the three of you arrive at a decision on who does what and has that evolved over time? Uh, no, why do we first sit across in the same table? It's, it's always been one table, one cubicle, whichever way it worked. It was essentially that in the area that we are playing in, if we had narrow verticals or silos we looked at, we would perhaps lose a lot of the knowledge that we gained. And while you can set in formal mechanisms of knowledge sharing and platforms, the easiest way to learn knowledge is if you're just present when it's being there. So that's been one thesis that if you're all sitting in the same place, even if as you look at different aspects of a role, we achieve two things. There is a kind of a half a year you can pay attention to what's happening around. People, employees who are working with you, or partners who are working with you have a comfort that you can easily substitute for another. That was, and knowledge sharing is in real time. That was one objective. The second thing that we followed then and even now is for any large material thing that we're doing, whether it's a project, client, or engagement, anything that we're doing, two out of three founders always get involved. The idea of two out of three is always is more in context of A, uh, somebody is a bouncing board. Second, the, the fact that there's continuity in case somebody needs to take a break or is away on a vacation or whatever. And there are always more than one perspective on a topic. So that's been the thesis flows into the way we handle work. Over a period of time, uh, there has been a natural kind of uh, movement of Karthik looking at technology and let's say uh, aspects of product. Ajay and I look at the rest in some divided format, which is you could talk of it as client and market facing and then internal functions. Uh, that said, we would have a fair degree of substitutability vis-a-vis each of us amongst us to take over any other function, to alternate functions. So it's sort of like a hybrid between the three of you. 
in essence, I think that's been the strongest advantage builders had that as amongst the three of us, we would perhaps in a functional sense cover for every competency that a startup might initially need. Specialism is a different thing, but typically what would happen if you're a single founder, for example, you could be a strong tech person and therefore you would have to figure out whether it's a co-founder or a senior man gaps on the other functions. Or you could be a strong marketing guy and you can compensate. I think in the times we started, as among the three of us, we pulled in all the necessary initial skill sets, I would say, to be able to. Uh, we talked earlier about I think in a different context about how whether time is a valuable resource or capital is a valuable resource or people are a valuable resource, right? I want to stick with time for now and your time, uh, which I'm assuming is one of your most valuable resources, probably the most valuable resource. How do you think and plan your time on a daily or weekly or monthly or quarterly or even an annual basis? How do you how do you decide what to spend your time on in the context of Build Desk? I think it's interesting that you def added the phrase in the context of Build Desk because... Uh, Should I remove it? No, no. <laughs> I'll give you a word. See, uh, the, you're right, time is, limit, time is limited. It's a, it's a context of... In what context one sees it uh, and to what one believes in the larger philosophy of life. Uh, so I come from a perspective, time is limited, whether for everybody in terms of the lifespan one lives in and what do you kind of set to achieve in that time. That's, let's say, a personal philosophy, which you obviously bring into play at every place. Uh, to that extent, I don't think of anything as being a milestone, that this time one needs to achieve anything other than the one philosophy that in the time that's available to you, what are the things you're doing to to arrive at your true potential of what you are capable of, right? And there, therefore, to me, there are no milestones to say this needs to be done in five years of life or 10 years in life. It's about realizing true potential. That's a personal philosophy. Obviously, when you apply to a corporate context on this thing, in a working sense, you, you have to ascribe milestones, say this is what you want to do, allocate time. Uh, and that changes over the course of any organization. What you want to do in the first five, seven years, 10 years, 15 years, that changes. It's obviously dramatically changed over the last six, seven years, given the change, particularly in the, the framework of what we operate in both market and regulation. How do we allocate uh, time today at 2020, 2022 or 23 is to figure out um, the niches of product that will still keep us relevant today and the next few years, and the niches of market opportunities that help us uh, still be profitable. Because these are the core things that are could, not... Could, could, you, could you break this down to perhaps a weekly scale or a monthly scale? Like, you know, how does this... I mean, what do you do on the niches of product or market? So very honestly, on the time frame of week or month, nothing changes for us, right? Again, you need to get the context that we are into the 24th year of our organization, right? So uh, in general, our perspective at any point has been what is it that we do which is going to be relevant four or five years later? It's never been about... What do I do which kind of first to market in three months? That's never been the way we would think that if we say this is an opportunity set, what is sustainable in that space? And good or bad, I mean, it can, it's again a matter of how one thinks of it. Good or bad, we are not driven by a need to be uh, winning the laurels for being the first, right? If, they, if there's anything that we're keen on, it is that we win laurels for having built the most sustainable thing, right? So honestly, we don't think of anything on a week or a monthly time frame other than what is driven by a, an execution need at a point in time. But if you were thinking more from an organization planning or anything, we would just say in this kind of environment, what do you do, which means you're still going to keep going at the same pace over the next two, three years, not broken on it. And that goes down uh, without giving away any secret sources of the business. It's about in a product, what are the hooks that you build that, that will stay relevant. Part of that needs this visioning, which is say, you have today a certain product, you have a certain market need, you have certain competition, competitive dynamics, right? All this put together, what does it mean for the market two, three years down the road? And what matters at that point? So you, it, that's how we would typically think. So if there is, let us say, a new variant introduced, let purely on a, on a payment method, let's say on a cards or on UPI, 
a large part of the market is focused on saying, can we be the first ones to announce that we've built this feature and we are quick to market, see we are great on the platform, right? Where we would interpret that is, if this is going to be there and this is how market will play this or competition will play it, what does it mean in terms of potential three, four years down the road? And what aspects of that will, because finally at the end of the day, today, payments has become a commodity. Uh, one needs to figure out those hooks that will make the commodity relevant to a user. And that's that's our only focus. So sticking with this, perhaps I could rephrase my question. In a typical week, what are these activities, if they are meetings, if they are something else that allow you to in make these influences on the organization? Are these product meetings? Are these? I'll, I'll give you a sense of that, but maybe let me better answer the, the earlier question juxtaposed with this with reference to something that you perhaps readily understand, which is recurring payments in India. <laughs> okay. Uh, so let's look at the time frame of how this played out. Uh, in 2000, late 2018, uh, when, let's say, online payments were happening in a big manner, UPI was beginning to happen in a big manner. We looked at, said, recurring payments, there are various ways you could do these recurring payments. Card account, bank account, uh, directly from the bank, from a merchant channel, from various ways you could do it. So we looked at how do you create something uh, which makes it a, a more relevant as a product and gives more control to the customer. Because till 2018-19, in, till the issue was as a customer, you could sign up for a recurring payment uh, either with the merchant, let's say in the context of Ken, that you sign up on uh, the Ken channel, or you could go to your bank and say every month debit my account, give it there. And then, then you could fix on what payment method this would happen, card or bank or debit. Right? End of the day, say, how, do, how does the customer monitor what all he's done and how do you put control back into this? Uh, we started working on a platform. Now, if we, you imagine there are various ways to think of it, which is to say that how quickly do you need to get this to market versus how do you think through this? To be clear, this is 2018. And this is before RBI's uh, ban on recurring payments came into effect, which was in October 2021. After much delay, I think, right? Like six RBI's or 12 enabling framework. RBI didn't ban anything. <laughs> but very, it, it's right. very interesting yes. to vote, see what RBI did, right? We thought of how do you do this uh, and where should control lie? And not to go to the technicality of this, historically, all uh, recurring payments were set up at a merchant or to bank, but as an acquiring sense, right? And that, that's what it was being done. We said we needed to build a platform. And how do we started working on one, which was an integrated thing for multiple forms of recurring. And we did deploy some of it with some of the merchants uh, in, in where it helped them kind of see it on one platform. Then came 2019 where RBI put out guidelines on what they expect out of recurring payments. That was there. And, and, the, and both from marketplace perspective in the banks, everybody was negotiating with the regulator on what they wanted changes in the framework. But we were building on the platform before it came and and, 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 uh, and the regulation came to the pleasant surprise for us because effectively we didn't need to make too many changes to what we were building, right? It somewhere fit into what the regulation wanted. So pandemic happened, markets took time to build everything, but effectively we end of the day, we delivered SI Hub as a platform, right? Uh, others too also built in the same space, same time. Uh, cut to 2023, you would, I would like to believe SI Hub is the most relevant platform that's there with most issuers connected on it and a majority of transactions in the marketplace happening on the platform. Now, is it something you achieve because you say I can get a war room 90 day uh, delivery to a product? You could, they, and there would companies who would do that, but I believe it fundamentally succeeded because we laid the foundations across the marketplace of what it takes for a platform like that to work, right? So in that environment, let me tell you how would a meeting go? A meeting would go tell people that we have something, but you need to build something which A, disrupts what you're currently doing, but this is what would happen, right? And then you West teams saying, check with clients if this is what will work for them, right? In this case, banks or merchants. And if it doesn't work, what are the advantages? So that's how our thinking went. Uh, so that's the historical context to give you an example platform. Current context, what would our focus be? To the, I would break in two parts, regulatory and compliance is one and product and business second. In the last 12, 15 months, there's been a bit of an overhang on the regulatory and compliance, primarily linked to the number of changes. So a lot of meetings in builders start and end with saying, in the field of work we are doing, are we 100% compliant? Not with just respect to today's regulation, but 
with the spirit of what we understand the regulator wants. I would like to believe, again, maybe you could be flattering ourselves, we have a good sense of the spirit of things, of what a regulator wants, rather than just the word of it, right? So when a regulatory guideline is put out, which could be eight, 10 lines, we would perhaps spend eight days discussing what is the intended spirit. In view. So there is, I would say, when we do some of the senior management meetings, the 50% uh, of the time would go on these aspects. 50% of the time would be in terms of market-led deliveries, which within this framework, how it's working. You mentioned the senior management team, which in many organizations would also be called a leadership team. I would like to understand how has the idea of a leadership team and the actual leadership team evolved at Buildesk from the time that you started? The original leadership team would have been the two, three of you, right? And today that leadership team would be very different, but I'm sure it's gone through evolutions in your own minds perhaps of what is a leadership team? How big should it be? Uh, what should it do, etc.? So I've never been able to figure out if, you know, the buzzwords of we pivoted, we evolved. To say we didn't pivot, we didn't evolve, whether good or bad signals, right? Mm. I, I will, that's only time to tell. I don't even kind of particularly believe anybody external can judge on those. But a couple of facts of Buildesk. When we started in 2000, beyond the philosophy we discussed, we also did one more thing. We said builders would have uh, no defined hierarchy for people in the traditional organization sense and no designations. 23 years later, we still stick to that. Uh, we have no designations. I mean, uh, other than what is a regulator required to say, a company secretary, see, so I mean, those kind of uh, ask. So apart. what are people called? People are just called a member of a certain team. Uh, 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 appointment letter would say you're a member of a technology team, member of a business team, right? You could be a member of a team with a, let's say, a one crore salary. You could be the member of a team with a five lakh. Your appointment letter will not read different. Your designation will not read different. You could be sitting in the office next to a person who's one twentieth your salary or twenty x your salary. There is no carved out places for people. They fix places to it. It's not we are saying it's a hotspot for anything. But there is genuinely no uh, hierarchy in terms of saying pe people of will sit here. They will have. Whatever the, uh, the, but there must be a reporting hierarchy. There is there is a re working relationship. So I said, therefore, where does what does that what did why did we start? That's one of the, obviously the joys of starting something when you can define your own rules. It came from two reasons. One, as I said, we in times we were building and in the space we were building, it they weren't there wasn't talent in the market. You had to build that talent. So the idea was when you get in the first ten people, you might have been let us say a, a banking relationship guy in a bank. Idea was to get you in, train you in the product we were building, and then figure out if your natural inclination was the client relationship handling the product or the business. So in the initial teams, that's how it started saying, we're getting people. India had no definition of product at that point. See, technology was IT. In those days, just to use the word, you had IT and MIS teams. You didn't have a vertical call product. No bank had a team called payments. And you had relationship management people in the traditional sense within banks or other organizations. But that definition was more you know, uh, of just purely managing relationships, right? We needed in our context, uh, the relationship manager being able to handle whether it was a GM in a bank or a uh, officer, explain to them the product, be able to answer questions, okay, how does something work, be able to demo it, give them comfort, right? So we needed a more well-rounded, let's say personality of, which means the person had to have skills of product and little understanding of tech, a little understanding of the legal framework to the business offering. So that's how we, when we got our initial 10, 20 people, all were kind of groomed into all these roles. Sort of like a general management program. Effectively, right? But again, I said, this we didn't distinguish between a two-year profile or a 10-year profile. This is about, we said, and this is where we won in the initial is against our competition, right? Because uh, I'm, I know I'm jumping topics a bit, but the difference between build desk and then that time competitors was, a competitor would go make a pitch, let's say to a, in a bank or a merchant with a certain thing. And the person would say, I need to know something more. And they would say, okay, we'll come back with four teams. Build desk case, the person would say, tell me and I'll tell you the four things right across the table. We built a capability to a level, and we've done this, where you'd go for a meeting, start explaining the construct, but the person across the table had the ability to walk you through the product, the tech, through the agreement, and if you're okay, sign it there, right? It, it, to that level. So that's how we built it. That's how people remain. So, so in many ways, you're also trying to create more founders. 
because typically founders are these um, Swiss Army knife skills kind of folks, right? Where they can do client conversations, build a product, understand customer success uh, requirements, etc., and all that. Is that what you were trying to do? Uh, to be very honest, I don't think we would we would, we would have articulated then that we're even now. Uh, I know it, it would be a good thing to say that we are targeting, but honestly not. What were we trying to do? We said that we we're trying to build an organization. At that point, we didn't have an idea of how many people we would need. We just said it can't work in a new territory with us. You may as well build the resource base. We saw that as part of a response saying we need to train 10 people in all ways for them to deliver the best for builders, also for them to figure out what they're good at. And in turn, give them freedom to say if they needed four people or 14 people, you would define it that way. And somewhere that became cultural, right? So today also you have people who would have these skills. Uh, when we're building founders, uh, if I were to take that path, uh, then the one ingredient we didn't push into them is the ambition or the aspiration to break away to do something new on their own to explore their potential. We always said, we're giving this freedom, we're giving the choice. What you would perhaps do elsewhere, you could do here, right? Uh, and if you had to go out, it would be for a different, if you're only if you're dissatisfied here, right? And I think many of, if I were to look at the first 100 people in Buildesk, uh, got over the first five years, I would venture to 70, 80% of them are still around, right? So I think in some sense of what we gave them as an opportunity platform that's worked for them, uh, they've got perhaps all the freedom a founder gets in a different organization without the responsibility or the headache of figuring out the, the investor and the capital side of things. Uh, to, uh, to come back to my question, so therefore, the leadership team or the senior management team, what does it look like at, uh, yeah. I know you've given me like the philosophical answer to there are no designations, but I mean, out of out of the 800 odd people who work at this thing. So what it's you, more role led of hmm. what they're doing at a point in time. If I were to give today the, and define the team as in a, in a typical leadership meeting, we would get in, let us say, 18 people, including the founders, All 3 right. plus 15. But why you will not get a sharper answer from this, maybe if I can index it, because one way people readily understand the absence of designations. Mm. I could tell you, for example, that if we had EVPs and age, you know, uh, uh, associate, that's one way to define it. Mm. The other way for you to define that if you assume people's compensation is reflective of the role or the mm. structure, uh, the ratio continues. The leadership team would have a person who's X and somebody who's 10X. So it's it's not so it's not from that. So if you're saying in a certain function, so it, that leadership team would have ref, uh, people from all aspects, whether it is the business side, the product, tech, finance, HR, compliance, legal, everywhere, right? And clearly it would follow that some of the functions uh, would not scale and sell as fast as, let's say, tech or product in today's context. So at one level, that is that uh, uh, reflection. But um, yeah, but the leadership team typically would have 15 people who, if we had founders had a message to for the organization to deliver, the 15 people are represented in the pool that can convey this and make it work through the organization. So we get in people in the meeting who then have the ability to kind of take down a message or get something implemented. What are some of the markers of leaders at builders? What kind of traits might they possess? He, again, in a 20 year history, uh, we've, uh, we've tried to build a team that possesses multiple markers with the ability to, to bring sharp focus to a certain marker at a uh, point in time given market, right? But as an underlying thesis, uh, the key mark would be, I, I don't know if I, I would define a stability and integrity, core marker, right? Uh, so that seems to align well with a lot of the stuff that you talked about, Buildesk as an organization and how it sees the world. So right. Naturally, even yeah. the employees have to see the world in the same way. Correct. And if I were to add to it, right, it's be because the structure that we have and the kind of I would think of it as great freedom to rely on replace on people. You can build some of things like, let's say, various parts, whether it's from a compliance, integrity, process. You build either through process or through people, right? We have tended to build that at some level through people with processes being a check, right? So 
it's not that if there's something that you as an employer are doing, there'll be 50 processes to go through, right? There is, we would want to focus on the fact that the leader there has the right integrity. And I say integrity across various things, integrity in thinking to execution, to financial integrity, to various parts of it, and then leave it for them to build, right? So that would be the core marker, I would say. Uh, uh, second is patience. Uh, uh, the third aspect you should know, I mean, again, consistent, no hierarchy to no, uh, we also never had financial metrics as KRS for anyone, right? Because the, as I said, today maybe we would do it differently, but context of times to what we wanted to achieve, we, we believe that if people could do the right things with the right sort of opportunities being given, the build desk objective and the founder vision is being, being met. It was not something that we needed to measure through financial metrics. That's how we've always- What done. is the build desk objective? Do you have a North Star goal? I mean, what kind of goals? If not for financial metrics, what kind of metrics does a organization focused on the long term aspire to? So when we started, we had a, a slide, which, which again, you need to think of the context of 2000 when the market was where, where it was, we said our aspiration is that every digital transaction goes through a platform. It doesn't matter in terms of the materiality of which phase of it, that was it. That still is our goal, right? What has changed? The, the change since then, the market's dramatically changed in terms of uh, uh, payment platforms available to the consumer, right? So that obviously has a limiting factor. Second, there is a regulatory framework which will essentially ensure you cannot be the, the only platform doing everything else. So, but within the constraints of what the, the, the market-led constraint, let's say the framework-led constraint of policy or regulation, our goal is still that, that any digital transaction that's happening, you would want it to go through our platform, right? So identifying the trend that gets us there is important. Uh, and that still remains that goal. You said something a while ago that one of the reasons why the three of you started a business was to be able to set your own rules, <laughs> right? While running an organization. What are some of the other rules that you've managed to set and stick with? I'll make a small correction. It was not one of the reasons we started. I think once we started, we realized that it's one of the joys of starting up is that Great. you have this privilege of doing that. All right. I think it just make uh, the, no, I make the distinction because at least speaking for myself, right? I think my biggest learning ground was ITC, where I worked nine years, right? 100 year old organization, defined hierarchy, everything. But yet within that, I had enormous freedom to learn to do my work, right? So it is not that we came from a perspective that hierarchies or organized structures are negative or anything. It is just that we all, all three of us in our own environments of growing up of uh, work or even prior to the institutions, we realized that if you have, so to speak, the right boss and the right platform, there is great joy in what you can do. So this was the the uh, this was the interpretation to you know setting rules. So this is one rule. The second, I think the core rule has been uh, do what is right, right, uh, and which 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 is tested only against. I think uh, highest it is tested is on. Uh, the integrity of what we're doing and the sustainability, everything else comes third, including to an extent of saying the, the financial success or uh, the, the glory metrics. They don't, actually glory metrics don't figure anywhere in our scheme of things. Uh, but this, these are the two. What, is, what does sustainability mean when it comes to evaluating a decision? Like, could you give me an example of, eval because sustainability is at many levels, it's an abstract concept. When you say it has to be sustainable, what does it mean? Are you saying it should not it, be unprofitable? Is that what it is? Is it something no. else? Sustainability, if there's a value being delivered, is one core construct. In a fast changing world, can you define that? Obviously the issue is about what period it will be. But when I mean sustainable, it is slightly, I think what I'm contrasting it against is the approach which says, uh, let's experiment with this in a, matter and see whether it succeeds or doesn't, right? We could do that at some small delta things, but in a large thing, for example, we would, prime, again, remember that we play in a regulated space. So what we're conscious of is 
anything that you put out can have implications for customers, for money flows to various things, right? So it's not a place where you say uh, experiment. And I'll give you one, let's say. So it's a deliberate high conviction. Yes. I'll give you an example of it, of where it would get. So in the, in the even during the COVID period or later, one of the most attractive segments to play in the digital market were all these uh, digital merchants who came up. And you could think of them, the businesses they were doing as being either digital lending, gaming, crypto, whatever, right? Uh, and believe me, they were they they are they were super high in growth and super high in terms of profitability. Uh, but it's a conscious call not to do any of those merchants, irrespective of the appeal that the, uh, uh, a market-led framework would provide to say. I mean, that, not to provide payment services. Yeah, for you, you make a choice of merchants, right? The, there are various ways to think of it, I mean, and some, sometimes you can, you can evaluate companies only by looking at the past, right? That's a good indicator how they'll play out in the future. You will find we didn't play any of those segments. Today, those segments are taboo. There's a regulatory payment, there are penal provisions, there are embargoes, everything, right? But it's a very conscious call to say that we wouldn't do that. Second conscious call, if you would look at it, UPI under regulation is not a chargeable product in, an, in any fashion. The law is very clear, direct or indirect, you won't charge. You will find we are perhaps one of the few players, if not the only player, who doesn't truly in spirit doesn't charge for it. Uh, people, other people have found ways around it, and I would think the market as a whole, perhaps as a, a, a profit pool of over 100 crores or 200 crores being made out of charging what you're not supposed to charge. So one view is, can you get away with it? Versus are you not supposed to do it? So in that sense, you're old fashioned. If there's a framework which says you're not supposed to do it, we don't spend time and effort to figure out what are the cute ways to get around it, not our DNA. Interestingly, one of the traits that you said for those who get to be successful and build as is patience. Now, no one comes with inbuilt with patience, right? Patience is, I would say it's an enabling, it gets enabled in a certain kind of environment or organization. Right? Like, you know, you could bring the same person, place them in two different organizations. In one, they would end up being patient. In the other one, they might just leave. So what is it in the build desk operating environment that allows employees to be patient? Because it's, it's not, it's, it's rarer and rarer today for employees to be patient because you know, they see everyone getting promoted every year, jumping jobs, and here you're saying, be patient. How? Sorry. Uh, I, I talked of it as being a virtue that you'd find within the leadership team. Um, and, and yes, you would be right in extrapolating, saying that becomes one of the attributes that gets a person to succeed. Um, I think a lot of it is get at that level gets filtered at a in the hiring stage. I guess that you're looking for uh, a certain kind of gravitas to the person. You're looking for some terror. I mean, you can make out, especially seen a level as to how composed, calm they are, the uh, how thoughtful they are, and what they say or do. And I think there's some bit of a selection process that happens. That we obviously get some. Sometimes we do get it wrong. And they, that naturally gets filtered at some time. Uh, but yes, I think it's, it's at that level. Now, can you, does it work for all the 800 people in builders? I would perhaps say no, but uh, because it's very tough, the earlier discussion we're having, to assess that attribute in somebody who's fresh out of college starting. They are, you know, bouncing with energy. So there's a way you leverage that. But at a larger level, right? Uh, even for those kind of people, because you're not building for something, we say, let's try it for a week, like a functional doesn't work, we'll pull it off, which is more, again, if you look at the business, we are a platform that's supporting other businesses. You're not directly consumer facing. So there is no great reward or glory in saying, can I experiment with the functionality which gets a million likes or a million views and people can move out. There is no, so to that extent, A, that's, I said, uh, therefore that's the quality we look for and B, over a period of time, I think people who stay on are the people who meet, who like that aspect of the business we're building. Uh, I mean, there are, I mean, as I said, it has somewhere has to meet with the person's profile. A person who's naturally has a different way of doing things or is happier to do with a different focus in terms of timeline. That there obviously will be people 
who want to deliver something see victory in week 10 days 15 days right uh, those kind of people obviously we, we benefit from them uh, in certain projects when they come in and whether they choose to stay or not is a question of how they are evolving them those people having said that i said this is not a comment on the attribute itself like in a like in a game of cricket you do you do need the pinch hitter to the you need the person who can kind of stay on on the turf right uh, when you're building something for the long term you so we clearly you know we're not playing the 2020 right you are playing the test match where in there'll be times when you need the pinch hitter but you we recognize that we're playing for the long term have there been times during builders evolution when you've found the need to be hands on in building culture we had to kind of roll up your sleeves to either fix or to imprint some aspect of culture in the organization i think through the 20 years i think the organizational feedback would be that in a in a in a operational sense uh, founder like to get involved into knowing the detail and rolling up the sleeves so directly or indirectly that's a very large part of the culture so as an independent effort to do a, a cultural thing has not been necessary i i'm interpreting your question these ways if we and which could well be a definition of founder today which is to say that you are focused with a lot of energy uh, on your energy on the external externalities to your business and maybe on the product visioning but not in the day to day bit right in which case then you kind of have to have this intervention say when do i step in to do something else we've been very very fairly well hands on uh, and so to that extent fixes happen as you go along it's not it's not something that gets set aside as a task to be done in any format it's ongoing always has that ever because 23 years and you're still hands on right like you know at some point do you do you observe that and see that is there a downside to that as well of not stepping back and because at the end of the day it's like zero sum game right uh the more hands on you are possibly the less hands on someone else could be or do you not see it like that i think there is nothing in life where there's a one zero answer right uh, you you could be totally distant from business and that can have its advantages you could be totally hands on it can have its disadvantages right it's about finding the right balance i think in builders case it's a question of what are we hands on about today versus what were we hands on about 10 years ago or 5 years ago that i would venture to say is dramatically different right how so so in the first years of the business you are hands on down to a functionality of product that's getting built because that's what's going to go out to the market you uh are setting basic rules of let, let me just take an, a different example of the construct of an agreement with a partner how do you want it to be we were hands on there to say it doesn't matter whether it's the largest bank in the country or smallest bank it will be the same fair templateness there is nothing extra somebody gets versus not if we are giving x to the largest bank we will give x to the smallest bank now you could leave this as a process not be hands on or you could say i'm defining this and i'm hands on then if you're hands on about this aspect in the first 3 years it tends to become the culture you don't need to be hands on on this aspect later so that's how what i mean is change uh some we are hands on today also in 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 what context it would be that if there is a new thing that's happening in the market uh a new variant let's say to a UP, upi and a variant on it understanding implications of it opportunity set of it to what can be leverages of it we would not say four product teams go do a deep dive come back to us with the presentation right we would say we evolve it together we want to be as much part of the discussion as opposed to being presented to saying this is the outcome of it right and that i believe is important in important things we may not do that for a a small development but let's say upi is a big thing if there's a development there we will get involved because we do believe it has long term and material impact right so that is the assessment change uh compliance matters we want to be as hands on as time will allow it doesn't mean that it doesn't mean that you're going to look at every return that is file information goes but if there is any small tweak of a compliance in understanding what it means for the company and what has to happen 
we we are part of the that debate or discussion so that as i said the philosophy is you're not missing on the spirit of what is intended left to let us say a larger chain in important thing you could play to the word of what is required not the spirit so we make the choice of where we are hands on i'll continue down the same path because you did say that there are things that like you know excite or challenge you uh, that you continue to work on to what is it i'd like to expand you uh, i'd like you to expand on that what are the things that continue to excite and challenge you on a regular basis today at work i think both for me as an individual and for by extension of thing for a large part even for the organization works in i think two things one what challenges us and therefore by definition the challenge becomes the excitement to stay how do you continue to uh stay relevant uh would be the number one challenge and 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 addressing the challenge gives you the necessary high or the right uh was this the same challenge 10 12 years ago may not be because there you're coming uh, it the the environment was less noisy uh there the, then the, that time the challenge would have been how do you convey to the market or how do you shape the market to believe that what you're doing is relevant and then it how do you build on it today the market environment or the overall environment different where there's a lot of noise lot of clutter lot of commoditization uh so you to go beyond the fact of saying i'm convinced that what i'm building is relevant because if the noise is so high that it gets drowned it doesn't matter whether what you're doing is relevant or not so overlaying that over what we're doing saying what we want to do is to be relevant but how do you make sure you're not getting irrelevant in the same period is structurally our biggest challenge today and and that i mean that's what keeps us going each morning to figure that out switching back to starting to now in most cases when people start a business they don't think that managing people is why they're starting a business but it turns out that ultimately the most important thing that you will do that determines the success of that business is how well you are able to manage people how has your management thinking or style or opinions around managing people evolved since the time you started to today what is your style today and how has it evolved Yeah, I'll go back to our history, right? As I said, I w- worked in ITC, where I think the whole market was one of the the biggest defining things to ITC is culture about people. In its history of hundred years, people who join leave the organization only when they retire, right? There's been, and I'm sure, significantly unconsciously shaped the way at least I think. Similar to Aj- Ajay comes from an SBI capital markets, and Anderson was a very large organization which had a similar uh, philosophies about people, right? So. i think when we started uh to now what has not changed is this right that people continue and are the most important people deliver what has to happen that has been the philosophy throughout right uh the second factor has been for us is that we believe people have greater potential than they know when they start off something and if you give them the the adequate degrees of freedom and the platform should they have the aspiration they will bloom in the right way right that hasn't changed either as a philosophy and but we do see that to your earlier point we see the change 10 years ago somebody more willingly took that those extra degrees of freedom to deliver versus there is a change of in people where the let's say uh, the the next generation doesn't necessarily want all those degrees of freedom in the way we think of freedom right their, their degrees of freedom might be different about where they work from how much they work on they're happy with a narrower profile of work whereas 15 years ago person was more greedy about a wider range of work those differences exist uh what has changed i think is this that sorry vasu i think i'd like before before you go on you've hit something which is very important and again like you know as someone who comes from the same age bracket as you do and some uh, you know i i i must ask you this right this is a very significant change because uh, you talked about back when you know people of our age started careers 
you were hungry to get more responsibilities and if you could do whatever you did to somehow get more work you know that was that was an achievement right because otherwise right to now where it's seen as this is my job and you know i'm i'm of course over generalizing and this but if you're building an organization today you still need to find those talented driven ambitious people because that's where growth happens like you said right like you know uh, when people try different things when they do more than what they think they have the capability for is when they truly grow so do you have any advice for younger or even mid career professionals on how to approach professions today to in, to maximize their odds for success in the long term uh i might have advice it might be not many might find it relevant to absorb it today but i do think the fundamentals of what uh, works uh, haven't changed now what has well, let's look at what has changed between let's say 20 years ago to now to your point right uh, a person who's who playing the role of an employee always looks at the environment says what does the environment recognize as success and how does it reward me right uh and we must recognize that when you look at a younger generation of people who are stepping in they are not defining the environment they're stepping into an environment that the previous generations have defined so today if we find ourselves in a certain let's say work culture we need to recognize that's been set that culture has been set by people who are possibly in their late 30s or early 40s right it's not been being defined by the 20 year old to 30 year old so when we look at people who are in the 20s and 30s saying this is how they are working or what they are doing you need to recognize this is what the 35 year old plus is rewarding them or not right so if we have to find either merit or uh, criticize that one needs to look at that generation uh, from a just age perspective the i think for somebody who's starting life at work today in the early 20s uh, the only advice i would have for them is uh, from just staying relevant to whatever they have to do constant learning is is the only way out for them today of a higher need than it was there for the previous uh, generations uh, second there is absolutely never going to be a substitute for attitude and hard work irrespective of technology changes evolutions what you get rewarded for what has changed the cycle in which you can find the reward right the, the, there is certain rewards that might accrue to you in 6 months 6 year but if you were to think of having to work enjoy work and do work these two things are still remain the core how do you prefer to be managed upward by your reportees mm interesting question let me just think for a bit I don't know if this answers your question, but I think from my reporter's perspective, uh, if I have a role towards contributing in their work, the best way to extract that contribution from me uh, is to be very well prepared when they come to interact with me. Uh, on a lighter note, that would apply even for not to this conversation, but to any other journalist too. That in any <laughs> that. Uh, uh, i go with the flow of a conversation even with a reporter for example right uh, uh there can be a bar to a, a bar that is set but i recognize people can inherently be different they can be somebody who can start at 60 and want to take the conversation to 80 somebody who can start at 50 to take it to 70 and somebody who might want to be at 80 and 100 i am not the kind of person who from a reporter perspective will insist they all come at 80 i recognize people can be fundamentally different but if your potential is 70 and you come to me with a preparedness of 50 Uh, yeah, I, pref- I would prefer if you came prepared to the best extent of your potential. Does Bellas have a culture of strong culture of feedback? Uh, may not be very formal uh, channels of feedback, but as I said, given the structure, there is pretty much very quick, instant feedback that would flow through. What's the best way for someone to give you feedback about the way you work? so may, you haven't others have but maybe you haven't come you should come to the build desk office as i said one beyond sitting it's an open office uh, 
as I said, there are no barriers, even a physical sense when people, uh, it's truly, as even as you're seeing in this office, people can walk in anywhere to to any of the founders and give direct in your face advice to feedback and whether the report is or not. So we have, again, it's over years, it's, we've seen all kinds of uh, thing happen, structured feedback versus feedback where if they think, and don't ask me for example, but if people thought that we wouldn't, uh, one person shouldn't be giving the feedback and three, four of them would say, look, as a group we feel. So we've gone through all the cycles that happens. Uh, um, yeah, and, and yeah, we've had extremely um, junior employees uh, come up to give feedback. And this is one learning I, maybe I should, anecdotal, but one learning from ITC. When I first joined ITC and I was what, 22 years old, uh, incidentally, the posting was in Hyderabad. Um, I would get into office by about eight in the morning and uh, work till late. And the 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 director who was in charge of the business on the board of ITC also had the habit of being in early. Had an equally important trait. He sat right at the first desk to the main door of the office, so there is no way you could kind of bypass him and go versus uh, ignore one. Why did he do that? That was a great learning. It, it made him extremely approachable, right? People who came could see him, acknowledge they would be eye contact. And he encouraged, uh, um, you come in eight, you'd say, I feel nothing, you're not in a tearing hurry, do some work, sit and chat, right? Uh, so that's one thing that uh, I think unconsciously seeped into uh, the way we work. Come in early, stay till late. So different sets of people always have the ability to approach you and talk to you. With the benefit of hindsight, what would you advise younger founders starting up today on some of these things? And I'll start with the first, building products. I'm saying this based on what I see, uh, and there could be different founders, different ways. Uh, there is a place for intuition and enterprise, uh, but is equally a place for sound foundational fundamental work to assessing product opportunity and market fit. Uh, you kind of balance both the chances of success are higher. I, I mean, I find, um, let me, I, I find an overweight on the first fit as opposed to the second. Organization building. Uh, high integrity, good value systems uh, cannot happen unless you lead from front and articulate it. It is not something that will happen in the background uh, or unconsciously. You need to state it. You need to state what defines it for the organization, what you want. Uh, you said high integrity multiple times during this conversation in a parallel universe where you were not operating in a regulated sector, would these values still be as important to you? And if so, why? 100%. But, but here is what I think at least shapes for Buildesk and the founders, right? Value systems often are a function of uh, how you've been nurtured which is essentially family, education, institution, maybe if you worked elsewhere, those parameters, right? Otherwise, I mean, other than if it's hard-coded in your some chromosome or DNA, it's not, it's essentially where it comes from nurturing. But in a larger sense, and I think that is, uh, when you're building something in a community or a society, uh, you need to do things the right way, because at, if you're doing something which is going to scale, which is going to be important, and then it's going to be material to society at which point it has implications beyond just the financial or commercial success of what you're building. It has to be of relevance into that ecosystem. You do not want to live in an ecosystem or a society where, uh, which is not based on these fundamental things of what, what traditionally one defines as good values. They can keep kind of changing uh, because that's no way to live life where it's, it's based on a bad value system. No way to live life. And earlier on, when I asked you a question about spending time, you caught on to the fact in the context of Buildesk. So I'd like to switch over to a larger view mm. on life. Mm. What are your weekends like? 
um, that's changed a lot over the uh, over. So this is now what my thirty fourth year of working, right? So it's significantly changed over the years, and somewhere it keeps in tune with age, interests, environment. Uh, gone through the phases where weekends meant a complete break from work, meant moving away from the location you were in. Uh, to lazing around, I mean, those are the initial kind of thing. So today, a weekend is about uh, the biggest is being able to define thing what you want to do. I mean, I have no set routine to saying this is what weekend means to me. If weekend means that I'm happy going into work that day, I have the freedom. If if weekend means I want to focus on conscious choices, conscious and mindful choices. Yes, at some level. Uh, I, but we one thing that weekend has never, at least for me, it's never been the break that rejuvenates you for the next. I mean, that has never been a need, such a need. I've in my thirty-four years. Is that because you don't need rejuvenation, or because I I was, about, I was about to get to that. I think there has not been a single phase in my entire life, whether ITC, Athens, or Build Desk, where uh, work has not been a joy. So it has never been. It's just been part of life. It's never been that. Oh, I need a break from this. This is getting too. Deep. It's never been that. So I've been fortunate, I guess, in that sense. Many may not. So you're the archetypal example of, you know, the person when they say that if you like something, do that, and then you'll never have to work. I, I, I guess. In that sense, I guess. I, 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 all through the journey, I've enjoyed everything I've done. There's never been anything that I've done which, I would say, I've never enjoyed. All that I've done, all that I've do. Meets that bar, if I think of it, yeah. So when you zoom out and you're looking at life and your time allocation across mm. life, not just limited to build desk, mm. what were we missing earlier that you caught on to the fact that I was saying in in the context of build desk? How has your time allocation outside of build desk changed? No, it hasn't uh, changed too dramatically. I think uh, what the journey has enabled me to understand is there's certain things that you can do at a certain age which you can't do later, right? Uh, and the if in one sense, if I dial back to say what would I have done different time allocation, it would simply be that. Let us say, for example, travel. If I take travel. Uh, As a category, irrespective of what the purpose is for, right? I'm do, I'm not talking vacation, but of travel. It's easier done when you're in your twenties and thirties than perhaps later. Uh, my context can be different, even for people who, who, who let's say, who go through the curve of a married children. There's one angle to it. Uh, my time and work has meaning outside of work. Would have my leisure activities would have involved typically reading. um movies um and and from a, from a sport perspective would largely would normally get dominated by chess right in the initial phase i found time for all of these i would say in the last decade these have dropped dramatically uh one from maybe a saturation of those interests uh or in the ranking of interests i found work e- e- as exciting as those kind of breaks um the and at some point i think the uh, travel exploration for discovering self will come up sometime in life it uh, i think it's it's a natural next phase at some point uh, that will happen so outside of work what does personal time look like for you whenever that happens yeah. personal time would uh, is a completely uh, it's a different i guess weird space goes back to figuring why am i here to will i be here again ever what does it mean where does one come from it with those areas so uh, is I, i won't say interest it's not introspection it is more about uh, that would be seeking and learning because I'd, introspection may get i don't know the answers to that but it would be more more philo- in that range of philosophers why are we here on this earth to has there been a recent book you said that you've lost touch yeah, yeah. over time yeah not nothing in recent time i mean i, I the, the 
honestly no i mean there would have been a point in time when i would have been reading close to two to three books a week finding time last decade i would say almost zilch uh, any knowledge i might have anything comes second hand from somebody giving me a a spiel on what they found interesting which is as i said i however believed that i believe what i experience um, rest i is here say, as far as i'm concerned so thank you so much vasu it's been a pleasure speaking to you great speaking to you